So today, guys, uh, on Belfast Wheel, we have uh, Jeff Thompson. Uh, Jeff is, if nobody knows who Jeff is, uh, is one of the UK's top martial artists and self-defense instructors. Uh, Black Belt Magazine USA stated that he is the most influential martial artist in the world after Bruce Lee. Um, Jeff holds an eighth degree black belt in karate, uh, a black belt in judo. Um, Jeff has written numerous books on martial arts, self-help, fiction, and screenplays. And in, in 2004, sorry, Jeff won a BAFTA for the short movie Brian Paper Bag. Uh, Jeff's own autobiography, What's My Back, um, which is a Sunday Times bestseller list, was made into a short movie. And then in 2008, was made into a feature movie called Club. Uh, Jeff's recent book, The Divine CEO, Creating the Divine Covenant, um, which was released on 31st of July 2020, is now available on Amazon as Kindle and paperback. And uh, yes, thank you, Jeff, for, for coming on today. It's a pleasure. It's, uh, and congratulations on Belfast Real. That's really good. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, it, it, as I said, it's a uh, sign of being, it's, it's took a bit two, two years too long to get started, but um, it's good to get started. Up. That's the important thing. It's really yeah. good. Um, Jeff, just with uh, just with your own story, I'm I'm, I'm pretty fam familiar with it because I'm I've read a lot of your work over the few years, and um, it, you've been a big uh, help to myself as well. Um, I, uh, I emailed you in the past, and, and you, you got back to me, and you gave me some really good advice, which has kind of led to where I am today. But just just for your for your own story, um, your your own journey. Um, really been one of constant shape shift and use the title of one of your books yeah um or, or transformation can you can you start off with your own journey it, it kind of started with fear yeah um <clears throat> i was I, I mean i've said this story a lot so forgive me if there's anyone listening to it but i think it's the, the good thing with repeating stories is that each time you hear it it cements it a bit more and each time you hear it you'll hear something a little bit different because the person that hears the story the first time isn't the person that hears it the second or the third time. All the Bibles are full of repeated stories. All the different Bibles from all of the different, you know, if you look at something like the, uh, I don't know, the Three Mad Bhagavatam, uh, I don't know, 35,000 verses. The Three Mad Bhagavatam is where the Bhagavad Gita comes from. It's from the Hindu canon. And it's, it originally comes from the Vedas. It's the fruit of the Vedas. But there's 35,000 verses. Um, uh, I'd read the Gita, and then I'd read the, which is a chapter of the Mahabharata. Then I read the Mahabharata, which is a chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So each time I'm thinking, I'm, this is an epic read, and I was quite proud of myself for getting through it. But at the end of the Srimad Bhagavatam, I thought, well, that's it. I've completed it now. It's 14 volumes. They're all big books like this. And you think, that's it, I've, I've got to the end of it. And, and of course, you realise at the end of it that this is, this is just 35,000 verses from the 500,000 possible verses in the Vedas and the Upanishads. But what struck me about um, the Bhagavatam and the Mahabharata and the Gita and all of the different Bibles I've read is that it basically just keeps <clears throat> reconstructing the same argument <clears throat> or the same problem in 35,000 different ways. So you just, it's just saying, this is your problem. This is the solution. Turn to me, return to me. Um, so it's like saying, <clears throat> you have a problem and you think the answers are myriad, but the answer is one, return to me. In other words, return to God or return to your um, uh, I suppose you, you could call it your geometric point, your singularity, your quantum vacuum, return to the, the, what the Buddhists call the quiet, the, the still center. So the problems are out in the manifest world and, the, and it feels like there's a lot of, a lot looking for lots of answers. There's only one answer, return to me, surrender to me. I am the almanac. I'll give you the answers to everything. The people won't get the answer from this unless the answer is turn to the guru within you. I don't want followers. I'm not looking for followers. You know, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in telling my story and, um, and as many times as possible so that people will find the inner guru, 
they will turn in and find their own singularity that um, the inlet and the outlet to everything it's like a black hole that's in the very center of us so we we can create from a single cell into you know a multiverse just from a spark of light from a spark of inspiration so if people are hearing this story and hearing it again and again and their ego goes yeah well we've heard this god you've told this 20 times that's the ego trying to scare you away it's going there's nothing new here actually there's something new every time it's told so the story my own story is exactly that i was suffering with depression all my life even from when i was a kid i had this dream to go out and do great things for my life but every time i ventured to the periphery of my uh, reality i felt this tremendous jolt of fear followed by in violent or destructive internal monologues um, and depression and this depression said i'm here i'm with you forever you can never get rid of me and if i do wander off for a little bit i'll probably wander back when i'm ready and i'll rape and pillage and i'll take over your life and you won't have you won't be able to do nothing about it this was in in judaism they would call this the evil inclination or the negative inclination that everybody's born with it comes from uh, the lower soul or the or the ego soul so it doesn't want growth actually what the ego soul wants is um it wants it wants um it wants to live forever it wants power it wants control it wants everything to be controlled but actually it's a pseudo king it's a pseudo ruler the only true reality the only real ruler is god or you know this this what you could call consciousness or, or go back to singularity where everything is everything so every time i went to the periphery of my comfort zone i was wiped out by depression on this final depression that i had again it was one of those and it, but if i'm if i'm if, if anybody out there has suffered with depression or is suffering with depression they won't need me to describe it only that it feels terrifying only that you feel like running away you don't want a kingdom you don't want you you know you don't want to go out there you just want to hide away you just want to be anonymous and um, you just want to be kept left alone you, you know i i became frightened of leaving the house i would follow my wife around the house like a puppy because i was so sad so i felt so alone and i've got children you know i've got young children but this other side of me wanted to go out and trip the light fantastic but every time i ventured towards it i've got no control of my own endocrine system of my own adrenaline so on this final depression i just found i would say that it was a, it was a a spark of inspiration i would say it was a communication with my higher soul which could only get to me when my ego collapsed so when i was when I, my ego had collapsed and i was in this place of um falling and and felt helpless i i was open to communication the door was open the ego said yeah i get it i've got no power i need help and the moment i was able to ask for help this inspiration come why not confront everything you're afraid of write everything down that you're afraid of in fact write it down on a pyramid but your least fear on the bottom step worst fear on the top step confront these fears let's see how real they are let's have a look at them they keep threatening this they keep threatening that they keep threatening to end your life they keep threatening to make your body ill they keep threatening to you know um control you they keep threatening to send you insane let's have a look at what that looks like what does it look like so i started to do all the mundane fears fear of spiders the fear of dentists i was a second down in karate a fear of um competitions all of these spurious fears so i started to confront them one by one and i did what ushiba maria ushiba who was the founder of aikido said we have to absorb 99 percent of our fear we have to intercourse with it we have to turn right into it so instead of running away and hiding which i've done a lot i've done a lot of that and that hadn't worked in fact it made it worse i turned into it and i embraced it and i absorbed 99 percent of it and when it got to 99 percent, it popped and the thing that was attacking me started to serve me so the nature of the fear was liberated it's gone forever and the effulgence the energy that was in the fear came over to me and i expanded and that happened on each step of the pyramid 
So, of course, on each step, you're, you're getting more confidence. You're getting more energy. You're getting more courage. Because you go, well, like Masashi said, if you master one thing, you master all things. If you overcome one fear, you've overcome all fears because they've got the same signature. So I started to uh, build my confidence, build my wisdom, build my understanding. I started to develop uh, what they call in Islam, Yaqeem. Yaqeem is an attribute of God. It's, uh, it's one of the 99 names of Allah in the, in the Holy Quran. And it's actually, they, it's, it's called a name of Allah, but it's actually a remedy. When you, when you read the exegesis of the Quran, you know, the explanation um, and the commentaries, um, it means remedy. It's not like, um, oh, I've got this name of God and everything's fine. This name of God is a remedy. It showed me, it said, you found a certainty. You've overcame fear once. You've over overcome something that you didn't believe could be overcome. You thought it was real, but it wasn't real. And the remedy, the remedy is certainty. You're certain that's not real. So if you're certain that's not real, then surely all your other fears are going to be the same. There's only one reality, and that is this oneness. That is this absolute. So I started to develop certainty. I wasn't really able to articulate that too much later. But I understood now that I was developing certainty and that certainty gave me confidence because every time a fear rose up and I'd feel fear and I'd feel like running away, I'd go, oh, now hold on a minute. I've got some certainty. I have certainty. I got certainty when I overcame that fear. Now, the fear of spiders and the fear of violent confrontation might seem worlds apart, but they're only separated by degree. For me, they're the same thing, really. It's just, you know, you are intercourse in, in embracing something that is holding you captive, that's keeping your world small. It stops you from accessing consciousness or awareness of what's around you, your potential. But the key was, not only did you have to um, absorb 99% of the fear, you had to eat, eat it. So you have to eat fear. So you have to actually... Uh, digest it you have to bring it in you have to chew it up take the goodness from it and then spit out what's not any good in esoteric practice they call this feeding the bear if you fall into the fear and, and the fear devours you then you've been eaten by the bear if you're able to observe it uh, without without emotional engagement and intercourse with it and absorb it and challenge it and bring it in then the bear feeds you so this negativity that I thought was the harbinger of doom actually turned out to be um, a necessary ingredient in transition. It was necessary. Just as a negative pole is necessary to be opposite of the positive pole in a light bulb. You've got a negative pole and a positive pole, and then you have an element that goes in the middle that creates light. No element, then, then the negative and the positive are powerless. So we need an element. And the element in this process is the human will. When we capture our own will, when we reclaim our own will, our own sovereignty, <clears throat> um, when we capture our own will, then we have the ability to do anything we want in the world. And if you look at the Bibles, the Bible talk about entering the land, entering the promised land, entering the garden, entering paradise. The word land but the root, the root word to land is will. That's what it means. It's an allegory. So when it says we're going to enter the promised land, the promised land is when we enter into our own will, when we enter into the ability to control our own will. So I can get up at five in the morning and meditate because I have control of my will. I can go and do things that are difficult because I have control of my will. I have enough control of my will to overcome my own biology so my biology my endocrine system you know the adrenaline might say run fight well i can just say no let's have a look at this i'm going to go and do this it might say don't go to that meeting don't do that talk don't start that business don't don't engage in that relationship but i can look at it and discern and go no, i'm going to try this i'm not going to listen to fear fear shrinks our reality down to nothingness and if we are able to lean into the sharp edges of fear and embrace fear and intercourse with it, we're able to eat what is eating us. 
we're able to um, absorb what has been absorbed in us. So we're able to use what was used in us. So it's, we have to ask ourselves, am I in control of, uh, you know, am I in control of my will or not? Um, and most people would probably have to say that they're not. So it's about getting the, the will back. So I, this is this is the process of what I learned climbing the fear pyramid, certainties. And at the top of the pyramid was um, was a fear of violent confrontation. So of course I did the only thing you can do when you have a fear of violent confrontation. I took a job in one of the most violent nightclubs in Europe. <laughs> I look back and I just think, what? His voice is going, run, you fool. What's the matter with you? Crazy. People thought I was crazy. But climbing the pyramid, everything changed for me. I started to stand up to my, my wife. My, I used to let my wife bully me. She was a good girl, Jonathan. She wasn't a bad girl. Yeah. I loved her bones. But I was so soft and so such a walkover that she just filled the gap. I stood up to my mom. I changed jobs. I got off, I got off the shift work i started to run a martial arts class um i started to, to i started to write articles and stuff and started to get back into the right all the things i've been afraid of doing i started to do so you know by the time i went on the door i'd left the factories i was working on building sites where it was very hard you know um so i became a nightclub doorman in a bid to overcome my final fear thinking i'll i'll, I'll overcome that fear and that's it and of course, I went on the door and realized straight away, I, I am just not cut out for this. I was so afraid. I mean, you know, Buster's nightclub was like Pompeii and Sodom and Gomorrah all mixed together. <laughs> it was equally seductive and violent. It was equally attractive and repellent. It was full of scantily clad beauties, beautiful women, beautiful men. But it was also full of ogres and monsters who would challenge any weakness. These people would see a weakness and they would, they would see a weakness that big and climb through it. So the first night I worked, I just thought, oh, God, you know, there was an old saying in Coventry. I spent five years one night in Buster's nightclub. It felt like five years. So I, I genuinely, it was the longest night of my life because I was just, my, I could feel adrenaline from the soles of my feet to the crown my crown the crown of my head was was crackling like a crisp packet with adrenaline it was i was so full of adrenaline um and i just decided i was going to tell the head doorman um who who spoke twice a year you know like he, cho he spoke like he was being charged by the letter he hardly spoke at all he looked like he was clint eastwood in black and he, he um, he looked like he was cut out of granite. He was just this, I think I was quietly in love with him. He was just this amazing spectacle of a man, John Anderson. He was so cool and so in charge. Um, and he just said to me at the end of the night, he said, you did okay. He said, you're a bit of a greenhorn. You know, he said, you're a bit naive. He said, but I think he just took a shine to me. And he said, if you want to come back, come back. You know, you, you came and you, you, you know, because they, they, they quietly ridiculed the martial arts. They, my black belt, I was a second down. It got me the job, but they didn't rate martial arts very much because they'd seen, they'd seen so many bad misuses of it. So many people who were supposed to be good who weren't, who weren't able to use it. So they weren't massively impressed with martial arts. But he was impressed by the fact that I'd stood on the door of one of the most violent clubs in the city. And Coventry was polled as the most violent in Europe for its size and population. Um, and I'd survived. So I was so euphoric that at these scraps of compliments that I just thought oh, I'll stay a little bit longer. And I ended up I ended up staying in that place four years and becoming one of the main doormen there. I was working sometimes six nights a week. And there were incidents every single night. So believe me, you are on the coal face. It'd be like I don't know, it'd be like working in A and A and E in a water war torn country. You get, massive amounts of experience and, and the environment molds you you become you become the, you become the shape of the environment and the environment teaches you immediately or, or it molds you into what is true what works so 
I became a doorman. I stayed on that job. Um, and the night, the night after I worked in Busters, I went back to my karate class and I stood in front of the class and they said, we're doing this all wrong. We've got to change everything. And that was the beginning of um, animal day training, reality training, you know, um, line training, circle training, all the kind of things I did to try and recreate a real situation for people that wouldn't perhaps be in a real situation so that they could figure out uh, what worked and what didn't work, who they were and who they weren't, you know, what their character was. And then obviously I've been on the door and I was working on the door and it was a, a life threatening job. So sitting down and writing a book, you know, which I'd always been scared of, didn't seem quite so scary now. It wasn't quite so scary to sit and write a book. Certainly I'd got something to write about for one thing. Um, and it felt a lot easier writing a book than it did um, standing in front of a gangster and threatening to shoot you. So I wrote a book about my, uh, my experiences called Watch My Back. It was a, just a slow burn. It didn't have much of an effect in the world of publishing. I only sold a couple of thousand. But it had a massive effect in the martial arts because it was suddenly this... Um, this kind of a club player, really. I wasn't really like a, a anybody known or anything like that. I wasn't a competition player. I was just a club second down um, who was looking for truth. Suddenly, this guy was coming out and speaking a truth that was uncommon, um, and it was going against everything they'd ever been taught, everything everyone ever been taught, uh, and so that kind of had a ripple effect. I mean, really, right across the world. It ended up in Australia. John B. Will picked it up. John B. Will is a kind of legendary jiu-jitsu player. He gave it to Richard Norton, you know, the film star. Richard Norton took it to America and gave it to Chuck Norris. <clears throat> Chuck Norris invited me over to teach these concepts in Las Vegas. So certainly I've gone from um, scared of spiders in the bath to um, uh, life and death situations on a nightclub door. <clears throat> and then teaching to the luminaries like Pete, you know, Pete, I became a, I became a joint chief instructor in the British Combat Association with Peter Considine, teaching for Chuck Norris, um, and I mean, really making a career out of it. You know, I was in demand everywhere. I was able, I was able to go all around the country and teach. And then, of course, because I was teaching about real self defence, but also about motivation and inspiration and possibility. I started to write my certainties in books. There were other books, not just Watch My Back. I wrote about fear, fear the friend of exceptional people. You know, I, I, wrote, uh, I wrote and books and did videos on what works in a real situation. <clears throat> I wrote, you know, so I specifically, I guess, specialized in fear and in, in how to manage fear, how to understand Adrenaline. I ended up doing a master's degree with the Society of Martial Arts through Salford University on uh, on the endocrine system, on on the effects of adrenaline. Called uh, and my thesis was called Stress Buster. It was about I don't know, about eighty ninety thousand word thesis on on stress. So I started to write my certainties down and pass them on, and because they were unadulterated, um, and they were coming from a a, an honest place and from a vulnerable place and from a place of wanting to serve uh, they were met they were met very well we will go See, right back to the beginning just sorry to yeah, just, okay. just i've just remembered and i've said this before but i remembered why why i'm sat here with you now why the books and the work is important why i've been gifted with these revelations it was because when i was depressed <clears throat> And I was looking for answers in books and they weren't giving me the truth. And I knew, I knew they either knew some of the truth uh, or they knew the truth and were, were afraid to tell me, which meant they didn't know the truth. Anyway, they weren't sharing it with me. And I remember getting angry one day and just saying, when I find the truth, I'm going to tell everybody. And of course, I realized when I started to write it, why people hadn't told the truth before. Because the truth, you know, you have to be very vulnerable tell the truth it's the first thing my brother said to me when he read watch my back my older brother he said are you sure you want to publish this and i said yeah why and he says because you're so vulnerable in this he said you are very vulnerable 
you could open yourself up to attack. And I said, well, what's the point in writing a book if I can't be vulnerable? How's it going to help people if I pretend I'm something I'm not, if I pretend it's something other than it is? So that's the arc of the story, really, um, in, in synopsis. You know, um, that, that's the thing. When I first, uh, I think I read one of your interviews in Morris Arts Illustrated, and that was the thing that struck me. Um, the world that kind of, I agree in a lot of people, um, I felt a lot of fear when I was young, and when you spoke to people about it, they kind of looked at you as if they go, what are you talking about? Uh, yeah. They, they, they had this image portrayed that we're not scared, you, you're the one who has the problem. She always yeah. kind of felt like an outsider. And Just you, yeah. <laughs> when I read your article, it, it, what struck me was, because um, obviously you see, see, see yourself, um, attend the pictures and, and then obviously you're reading and saying, well I feel fear I've I've I, I can almost relate like it really opened up uh it was the first person to kind of put their hand up and go yes I'm a martial artist I do all this but I'm, I also feel fear and uh just just even this that in before I ask this question uh your your breakdown of uh confrontations with people it 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 really I mean uh, again, it gave me something practical. Uh, there was an incident, I'm not going into too much detail, years ago where a person was coming back to attack me. And literally, as I said, I, I followed your almost a like blueprint. And I could, I could understand, the first time I like, could actually understand what was going on. And I was almost able to control it. It didn't get physical. Um, I was able to use that person's adrenaline on them to the yeah, point yeah. they didn't want to come forward to me. And when they walked away, I always remember you saying, let them walk away. And if they hurl abuse at you, just let them, let them keep walking because that's their way of saving face. Yeah. And that, that helped. So, so your, your, your writings have, have helped, helped me tremendously. I know they've helped other people. Just go, if, if, if we can, on the fear permit. When you were working your way through that, how, how did you, we could ask, how, how did you stay the course? Was there ever a time you kind of, when you expose yourself to fear, you kind of felt, oh, uh, uh, that, that wee voice kind of tried to take hold. How did you balance to keep, keep moving forward with that wee voice in your head? Well, the ref you've got reference points, which are your certainties. <clears throat> so, because obviously as you expand, you do, you do start to uh, encounter uh, more and more fearful things, but they might not be fearful in the same way, but, but they feel fearful to you. So the idea of going towards your dream, say for publishing a book or like for instance, when I went to teach in Las Vegas for Chuck Norris, I had a tremendous amount of fear. I just thought, I'm a, I'm a snotty nosed Coventry kid. I don't really know what I'm doing. You know, this is the voice that came up. It wasn't true. I was massively experienced by then, but I just kept thinking, I'll be out of my depth out of there. And then my environment started to mirror that. People were saying, oh, you'll go over there, you'll get challenged. They won't like you. They don't like the British. They won't like your message. You're going to be teaching with the Machados. You're going to be teaching with Ben Ukides. You know, that your message is anti-grappling. Your message is anti-kicking. You know, you're, they're not, it's not going to go down well. All of this, I started to have a lot of internal monologue. <clears throat> And I didn't recognize it. Uh, now, when, I, when if anything, if any opposition rises up in me, I always know that opposition is a sign of potential. If there's a lot of opposition, it means there's something very big to achieve. So when we go towards the things we want to do, the things we dream of doing, the opposition that is hidden in us will rise up. It will rise up to claim or be claimed. And if we don't recognize it, if we don't identify where it is, um, and if we allow ourselves to emotion, emotionally engage it, it will become us. We'll think it's us. And then we'll begin, I don't know why I'm so worried. I don't know why I'm so afraid. So what I learned to do was recognize, oh, there's a lot of fear rising up here. So there's a house ghost coming up in me, trying to stop me from achieving my goal. So the only way you're going to see these voices or these oppositions, um, Aurobindo called them the adverse forces. The only way you're going to be able to see these amorphous beings, these semi-autonomous thought forms, is when you head towards the thing that you would really like to do, um, and they will rise up and actively try and stop you. So they'll be invisible. When you move towards, say, publishing a book, you must have had it when you started to 
do London Real. That's um, Belfast Real. That's why it's taken you two years to get here. So that shows you what is in you. That that is trying to stop you from achieving your goal. Uh, but that those things that rise in you, um, if you're able to recognise them and claim them, they are consumed in the volition of creating Belfast Real. They're consumed in the volition of creating the book or teaching the course. So. There was lots of times when uh, things rose up, but I always use my reference points. I've been here before. I've felt this before. What worked before? Well, what worked before was I embraced it. Um, you know, I intercourse with it. I absorbed 99% of it. I basically used, to, I, I learned the technique where I would just go, it's called, uh, Victor Frankl calls it paradoxical intention. So we actually intend, the thing we're most afraid of, we intend it. So I'd say, depression would come. I'd say, come in sit down have a cup of tea let me get you something to eat stay as long as you want stay as long as you want and then you start reading things like francis saint francis and then you start reading someone like um miller reaper and you recognize they discovered the same tech the same exactly the same techniques when francis was locked in a cellar by his bullying father he was assailed by demons and he just said to them they threatened him with everything. And he just said to them, take it, take everything, take my body. It's, it's an enemy to me anyway. Have it, come in, stay as long as you want. <clears throat> they attacked him even more. So we turned to God, turned to his higher self. And he said, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Boom. He just disappeared instantly. Milarepa meditated in a cave for about 15 years. Milarepa was a, um, a murderer turned saint. He came back to his cave and there was four demons. Again, we're talking allegory. It doesn't really matter whether it's allegory or real, but we're talking about the fact that these thought forms arise in us. Um, and he saw them inhabiting his cave and he suddenly felt this jolt of fear. And this is a man that's been meditating for a long time. So he started to try and think about tricks to get them out and what could he do to get rid of them. And he realized his need to get rid of them just fed them. His fear fed them. So he went into the cave and he just said, how you doing, boys? Stay as long as you want. He said, let's just hang around. Let's see how your black magic works against my white magic. Boom. They disappeared. The moment, they, the moment there was nothing to feed from, they disappeared. So that was what I learned. I started to go, okay, I'm having a massive amount of opposition here, a lot of fear. There's something big in me that does not want to be exposed, and I'm going to go and turn up at that meeting. And I'm going to expose it. And I started to get guides around me. Uh, you could call them angels, or you could just call them, uh, in the Judaic text, they call them spherots or um, levels. So it's just like levels of understanding. So these levels of understanding that I've been gifted through the confrontation, desensitization process started to appear. And they would talk to me. They would just say, like I went and did the talk a group of uh, professional therapists and it, it doesn't really matter why this was some years ago but i i've never ever ever had so much fear so much adrenaline something in me felt unworthy they were paying me a lot of money they were paying me two thousand pounds to go and do an hour's talk i didn't want the money i wasn't interested in the money because there was too much fear but I wanted to go along to this meeting because I wanted to see what that fear was. I wanted to understand what that fear was. So I went along and I sat in a pub with my wife and we were having a coffee. And I was bent over. And then I'm talking about post-door. You know, I mean, you give me a set of pads, Jonathan, and I'll stand in front of anybody. But take the pads off me and put me in a suit and put me in front of professionals. And I was, you know, I was wobbling like an old lady on skates. You know what I mean? It was... So I was in this pub and she just said, I wish you could take it off you. And I said, I don't want you to take it off me. I said, I just want to, I'm going to turn up. But this voice appeared here just in front of me. This, this entity, I could feel it. And it just says, just turn up. Just turn up. We'll do the rest. And the moment I worked, the moment I, I wasn't, there was no full certainty till I walked through the doors of the college. The moment I walked through the doors, bump, they're gone. I spoke for three hours. Um, and, and that fear never came back. And if, if anything ever did come back, 
it came back in a different form and I recognized it. That was my reference point. I found a certainty there. Not just that, but afterwards, my wife gifted me a set of books by a guy called Swedenberg. Swedenberg did an exegesis on the Torah. The Torah is the Old Testament, and the Old Testament just seemed to be the blueprint of the universe. And if anybody's ever studied the Torah, they'll know, they'll know it's true. If you haven't studied it, you might just think it's a religious text and uh, back away from it. But anybody that's read the Torah or understands the Torah will know what I'm talking about. But she bought me a set of books, um, 13 volumes of Swedenberg's exegesis on um, Genesis and Exodus. Um, and it was revelatory. It was absolutely revelatory. All of these things we're talking about now, about confronting fear, about the adverse forces, about how they rise to consume you or be consumed. They are ordained. They are natural. They, they, uh, in, in Islam, they call them God's master swordsmen who come to teach us how to use our weapons. We think they're an enemy, but actually they are here to perfect us. Just like an opponent in your, in your martial arts gym or your boxing gym, the guy that you're going to learn from is the guy that's going to try and knock you out, of course. So uh, every time I have a big confrontation like that, there's always a reward straight afterwards. So I, I consumed that part of me that was afraid. It was liberated. And uh, the effulgence that was in it swamped in and I was filled with more awareness. And straight afterwards, I was given um, 13 volumes of books uh, on, you know, as a gift, as a reward. It's like I've made, it wasn't like someone said, I was doing well, give me the reward. I made room for consciousness. You can have as much of God as you want. You just have to make room for him. So we make room when we consume fear. Um, so that was my process. So every time the fear came up, and there was lots of times when I had to back away, when it felt too much. If I'm being honest, there were some times when I felt I was going slightly insane. In fact, when my wife was, <laughs> when my wife was typing out um, notes from a factory floor, which is um, a confessionary um, memoir, deeply confessionary, what I call my burnt offering. So that was me burning up my sin and uh, uh, making more room for consciousness. At one point, she was crying. She said to me, I'm reading this, Jeff, and I'm wondering whether you've lost your fucking mind. Forgive my language. And, uh, and I said, my mind, Sharon. I said, that, I lost that a long time ago. I said, that, that ship has sailed. She said, you keep talking in here about tightening the room. and when I used to have a technique called tightening the room when I was teaching, if I start to get stragglers and I start to, you know, if, if the proximity of the room, you know, if you've, if you've got a close proximity to truth, it either repels people or it draws them in. So I kept a tight proximity. But if I started to have people on the fringes, neither falling in nor falling out, I knew I needed to tighten the room. So I would tighten the room and people would fall away like skittles. And other people would fall in. So in other words, I just got, I, I became more certain with my teaching. I, I became more certain with my language, with my delivery. And she said, you keep talking about um, tightening the room and people falling away and all of your senior students are falling away. She said, I'm the only one left. She said, does that mean I'm gone as well? Am I going to go? It was really funny. But it was, it was, it's good when you write a book that, even your wife's going, should we publish this? <laughs> does, does this? Do people need to read this? And I said, well, I'm very scared of it. I'm very scared of publishing it. So yeah, people need to read it. it it's, um, very similar, it it's very similar to uh, Napoleon Hill. He wrote a book, I think it was in 1938, um, Interview with the Devil, or right? Between the Devil. And um, it was kind of, Long, not saying it's similar, but it was along the same lines like with yourself, and yeah. had a lot of doubt. And when he had this kind of internal dialogue um, the, the, with, with with the devils or, or with himself, and what we want to look at it, um, the the other self or the devil basically pretty much said to him, "You'll not you'll not print this." And he's like, "Why why would it not?" He says, "Because this will shake the foundation of everything." And yeah. there was a lot of fear uh, even after he passed away. The family held on 
I think wow, it was, I didn't know that. Oh, I've only only recently published. Um, it, it, I I discovered it through another podcast. Um, the the audio book is pretty good. Um, but it's this conversation with the, the devil and it's yeah. almost like a courtroom setting. Or a courtroom yeah. setting with your, your other self, and you're saying, "That's a brave book. Why, why is this happening, or, or, why, or why do you do this?" And it's, it's quite, it's quite powerful. Um, yeah. But he, he, he didn't publish for a while. With go, go, going, going into to uh, we're obviously just before you go on, Jung, yeah. Jung did the same. Carl Jung. Okay. He wrote the Red Book. Right. Uh, Carl Jung was this esteemed uh, psychologist, psychiatrist. Uh, Psychiatrist, you know, we, him and him and Freud kind of coined the, the phrase ego, superego, id. Very, very powerful. The head of, you know, the top guy really in the world. But he realized he was limiting. While he was staying between the physical and the psychological, he was always limited. And he said no one in the psychology world wanted to tip into the metaphysical. So he went deeply into the metaphysical. He had a breakdown, actually, but he wrote a thing called The Red Book. But he just didn't publish it until he died. But went again, same thing, very revelatory. He really found it, Young did. He was, again, but um, too afraid of publishing it in his own lifetime. So it's interesting. I didn't know about that. About no, yeah. So thank you. I've uh, learned something today. Yeah, I, I can send you a link so I can. Um, thank you, yeah. Go, go, on, go on in, obviously continuing on with that. I know, I think it was in uh, Watch My Back, or, or maybe in an article I read, you, you, you mentioned. You reach a point where you, you built up this physical armor uh, yeah. to, to deal with obviously the outside world, but you didn't realize that you needed to develop your the mental and spiritual armor. Can, can you talk more about about that? I know obviously you were kind of on that journey with the fear pyramid, um, but how, how did you then realize there's I need to kind of wage war within as such? Yeah, well, you you just kind of you reach a, a level physically where you have a, a a degree of prowess. You know, I was knocking people out every night of the week. You know, and I became really good at the physical. I understood. I I discovered the secret to um, physical self defence, and I perfected it. I was able to use it to a point where it was so potent. I was frightened to use it because we, I was damaging a lot of people. Um, but I started to realize that uh, I started to question what it was I was doing because I was obviously before you can be violent with somebody, you have to dehumanize them. So I wasn't dealing with, with a daddy or a son or a brother or a husband when they kicked off on my door. I was dealing with a monster. I was dealing with, you know, I'd, I'd got a conceptualization that created a form that created an aspect of like a, the con the conceptualization was that this is a violent monster the form was of a monster and the aspect was this monster is going to attack me so i need to attack him first so you can't be violent with people unless you dehumanize them first so i started to realize this because that one of one, one particular one particular situation i had i battered this guy i was in a fight with him he was a monster he deserved my wrath I batted him, you know, and my common thing in those days was if I knocked them out, when they come back round, I knocked them out again, or I injured them while they were unconscious. That was fear, insecurity. So they couldn't come back again. You might be angry at me tomorrow, but you can't come back because I've broke your ribs. So that was my, you know, that was my go-to technique. It was very savage. It was fear-based. But, I, you know, I was quite proud of the fact that I dealt with this and, you know, people patted me on the back. It was beard on the bar like winner's cups, the usual thing. Then the next day I was walking through town and I spotted this guy in the distance uh, and it just wiped me out. He, he, he was a daddy. He was a young guy. His face was battered. It was like, you know, it was like a car crash. And he was walking along, pushing a pram with a baby and it got two little daughters holding on to the rims of the, you know, of the, of the, uh, the pram. And his wife walking just a step behind him, surveying what was left of her husband, you know, his face. And it just, I just was overwhelmed with shame and conscience, and compassion. And I thought, where's the monster gone? This is a fact, this is a factory worker. This is a husband. This is a, this is a father. It's really made me question everything. I just thought I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to batter a daddy. 
wouldn't have been able to batter her husband. I can batter a monster, but this was, you know, just a factory worker having a bad night and trying to take it out. You know, he wasn't in any condition to take on a guy like me. It was my job. It was my profession. It's what I did every night. It doesn't mean he's not jet dangerous. I mean, these, you know, these people kill people in, in, in spontaneous acts of violence because they displace their bad day or their bad week or their bad life, you know, in a, in a moment of madness. Young guys, factory workers, drunks. Um, but just suddenly I realised, God, this, I just felt ashamed. It really made me go inside and start to look at that. And start to, I started to realise that that's what I was doing. I was conceptualising everybody as an enemy. I'd been taught as a young man that the world was my enemy. You know, I was abused as a child and that left me with the cognition, a parasite that said the world is against you. You know, the world is dangerous. Even the people that you love and admire are going to abuse you. You know, they're going to cross your borders and control you. So I developed this armory to protect myself against something that was just a conceptualization. Um, and once I started to realize that, I started to think, well, where are all these monsters coming from? Because I said to my wife one day, everywhere I go, there's violence. This isn't this city violence. She said, Jeff, it's everywhere you go. There's a common denominator here. It's everywhere you go. And I realized it was. I was getting in fights at weddings, at funerals. And, and we could all sit around the table afterwards and rationalize that it was fine. This guy de definitely kicked off with me. This guy definitely was aggressive with me. This guy, I definitely give this guy lots of chances. But yet it was still happening. I had a guy, I, I was at a, my friend's christening. The, a young guy kicked off. No one could control him. And someone, because they knew I was a doorman, they said, will you come and have a chat with this guy? I said, yeah, of course. I went over. And I just put my hand on his shoulder. He said, come on, mate. He said, it's a christening. And we don't need, don't need to have all this. Boom, he just shoved me away. And that was it. <laughs> I've gone. I've gone. Next thing I knew, it was unconscious at the bottom of a set of steel steps. And 10 people had to pull me off him because I was going to kill him. That was out of christening. Then afterwards, sat around, everyone was buying me drinks, congratulating me. He asked for it. It was his fault. But the, the thing is, I, I attracted that everywhere I went because there was, there was a perception in me that the world was against me. And my perception or my belief was so strong, I created that. I created the infrastructure. I created the, the infrastructure for monsters. I created the monsters. And I created the attacks that came, literally. In Hinduism, they say we create our reality. We maintain our reality. We dissolve our reality. Often we don't do it deliberately or consciously. We don't know what we're doing because we're not in charge. We just believe what we've been told or what we've been taught. And we go and create from that, uh, from, through those filters. What I realized was that my filters were dodgy and I needed to stop creating monsters. I was creating monsters, not realizing that I'd created them or forgetting that they're my creations. And I was developing techniques to defend myself against monsters that I'd created and forgotten. So I recognized that I needed to stop creating the monsters. That was the internal battle. That's what they call the great to jihad. Let out is when we go out into the world and physically take on physical things. You know, we, we, we go and, you know, we go out into the world and we, we try to affect the world in a physical way, an external way. When we understand uh, the reality of it, we recognize that the world is created from us. We create our own version of the world. So there are six or seven billion versions of the world. My job wasn't to make Jonathan Watson change his world. That's nothing to do with me. It wasn't to, you know, my job isn't to, to get to change my wife's world. My job is to change my perceptions, my, my cognitions, my beliefs, my, you know, challenge the precepts, challenge the conceptualizations. So I started to go inward. So instead of seeing the projection of monsters in front of me, I started to go in and look at where they came from. And I found these monsters inside me as semi-autonomous thought form, beliefs perceptions cognition so i started to uh, work on battling them at their core at their source so when the when the when the need to uh when the feeling of 
being threatened rose up in me. Instead of just acting out and being physical, I started to recognize where it came from, see the genesis of it, and stop feeding it. I stopped reading violent books. I stopped teaching violence. I stopped writing violence. I stopped watching violent films. I basically starved this violent parasite within me until it became emaciated and then it transcended. And then I was obviously this over a period of time, I had lots of, um, lots of little monsters in me. And as, as the ego contracted, my consciousness expanded. As my consciousness expanded, my ego contracted. So awareness puts light on and shadow resolved it but again same thing so the battle the 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 fight then became an internal one yeah if if you don't mind me uh bringing this up uh, i know i think and watch my back at the end um you by by sheer chance or or by the part of your journey you you came across your abuser from your childhood isn't that right yeah um can, can you if you're happy enough, can can you talk a bit about that that, that meeting or? Yeah. Well, I was abused at the age of eleven. I was sexually groomed. I was supposed to be between the age of eleven and twelve, and then uh, I was assaulted on this particular night, um, and it massively damaged me. Obviously, a year of grooming is more damaging than the assault itself because it leaves you divided against yourself. That's what demon means to be to have a demon in you is to be. It comes from the root word divide. It means to de- be divided against yourself. So I had these conflicting beliefs and they were placed in me by this person that abused me. And I realized that the broken nose and the cauliflower ear and the big wing, the back, and the you know, big arms and the ability to kill with a single punch, all of that stuff. I developed that um, to defend myself against this person and other people like him. Um, I took away all the prettiness. I was a pretty kid. I took away all of the um, beauty, all of the handsomeness, and I built myself into this armory, or a walking armory. And it was all to protect myself against people like this. It was unconscious. I wasn't aware I was doing it. The um, all the all the war paint. Yeah, uh, this is all my war paint. You know, it was all saying I'm dangerous. Stay away from me back is massive even though i'm a lot lighter now i've got a massive back when i was abused this guy came in from the back he came in in the dark and, and i so i've developed this back to protect myself his wings so i recognized i was building this massive armory um and i built it in order to protect myself against this guy and and obviously unconsciously and sometimes consciously it was like when i meet him i'm going to kill him i'm going to I'm going to kill him dead. I'm going to get my revenge. But by the time I got to that stage, I was 16 stone. I was a lump. I was an international martial arts teacher. I was a fifth dan, so I'd got like a master grade. So I'd started to tip into Budo. I'd started to look at the esoteric end of martial arts. So I'd started to work on the amorphous techniques, you know, things like forgiveness. Forgiveness has a metaphysical power. When, he, when I sat in the cafe, the universe placed him in front of me and said, it's time to retrieve your soul. This guy, this guy didn't just abuse you. He stole something from you when you was 12 or 11. And in its place, he, in its place, he put something in you. So he's stolen your innocence and he's given you a parasite. And that parasite has been feeding off you over a period of 30 years, even in his absence, even when he's not there. Because every time you think about him, um, you know, you're filled with adrenaline, you're filled with anxiety, you're filled with rage, and that just rates your energy. And also, he'd left, the, he'd left uh, you know, if you imagine being abused at, say, 11, and it terrifies you, every single decision you make after that, every single decision is influenced by that one thing. I became very afraid of living in the world. I became very afraid of being attractive of being noticed um, and uh, I, I physically self-abused, I sexually self-abused. I didn't even know I was doing it. I didn't, I had, I had two parts of my life. One part where I was a normal dad, normal, normal husband, another part where I was damaging myself physically. 
And if you read notes from a factory floor or CEO, it's in there, the, the, the detail of this. Um, but I didn't even know I was doing it. I didn't recognize that this guy had left a parasite in me and taken an innocence. This is why the rabbis of law would say, when you see an enemy, chase after him and do charities for him because he has something of yours and you need it back. And you won't get it back with anger or rage. You'll get it back by forgiving. And when you serve this person, you will retrieve your light and you will give him back his darkness. And that's what the allegory is from Romans 12, 20. That when you forgive an enemy, it's like heaping hot coals on his head. The hot coals are the negativity or the, or the parasitical entity that is placed in you. So you're giving him that back and you're taking the light off him. So he's dissolved, literally, and you have your light back. So I recognized when I stood in front of this guy that with all my physical prowess, if I went over and battered him, which I was tempted to do, it wasn't going to work. If I did that, I would just feed what was in me. Um, and even if I killed him, it would still feed what was in him. Because what was in him was coming from somewhere else as well. He got an energy in him that was coming through him and jumping across to me and feeding from me and everybody else he abused. And I knew the only way I was going to stop that was to forgive him. Um, so that's what I did. I went over to him and I offered him my forgiveness. Um, and when I walked away, I felt uh, quietly proud of myself because I thought well, I've forgiven him. That was a big thing. It's hard to do because I have the ability to be physical. But over the weeks and months, after that, I realized it was a quiet conceit. I realized I didn't have the ability to forgive him. That wasn't a power of God. That was not a human attribute. That's a divine power. I couldn't forgive him, but I could give him over. So forgiveness really means to give over. So it's saying, I think I've got the power of pardon over this person. I think I can hold the power of forgiveness over him, but I can't. That's not a human power. What I recognized what I did was I gave him back over to reciprocity. I gave him back over to God or to the law of compensation. And that would write the, that would balance the books. That would level the hills and fill the balance. I didn't have the ability to forgive him. I had the, the ability to give him back to his karma. I didn't even have the ability to forgive myself. We can't even forgive ourselves. But what we can do is we can repent. What repent means is, Repent means I've wandered off the path and I'm going to return. So repent means to return. It means refuge. It means repair. That's what, that's what repentance means. So we have this biblical, these biblical names and it puts people off, but it actually just means, yeah, I'm damaged and I'm going to repair. I'm, I'm lost and I'm going to come back home. I'm in a world of noise and turmoil. I'm going to come back to silence. So I forgave this guy. Um, and some years later, uh, he killed himself. Lots of other, lots of other um, assaults caught up with him um, from the 70s, and he took himself to a hotel room in London, and he killed himself. Um, and I felt compassion when I heard, because it was a life wasted. You know, I could, e I could easily demonise him, but you know, at one point, I loved this man. I idolised him. There must have been some goodness there, but he was captured by something himself. I have more compassion for the people he damaged. You know, there's a lot of people didn't get their day in court, but I have compassion for him as well, because this is a man who lost his opportunity. But that's when I knew I'd forgiven and I had compassion. Then, of course, I realized between the age of 11 and the age of 40, I had, I had done a lot of bad things myself because of displacement, because of fear because of insecurity um, because of what i've been wrongly taught i've done a lot of damage i've been extremely violent you know, people have a romantic idea of who i am I'm just this robin hood character that went on the door and you know fought for the ordinary man i was savage you know i, was, I kicked people's teeth out of their heads i stamped on their heads i stamped on their ribs as hard as i could and remember unless we forget they were these were people, they were husbands and fathers. And so I, in, that, in the time between I was, when I was abused and when I became a man, I created a lot of negative karma. Yeah. You know, just because you have an epiphany doesn't mean that goes away. That's stuck in the plumbing. 
So part of my um, inner game was to locate all of that. And I located it through writing by writing books and writing articles and uh, exposing it to myself. You know, sometimes I bump, I, I had a play on in Plymouth and I sat there and it was like, Oh God, I was in absolute agony. I couldn't even keep my eyes open. I had to close my eyes, hold my wife's hand. I was watching a life review of all the violence I'd committed. It was murder. And I realized what an ogre I'd become. And of course I'd left that behind, but the, but the residue was still in me. Yeah. So my job then became to locate all of that sin. Sin means when the word sin the, comes from the root word, uh, the root meaning to miss the target. I'd missed the target a lot of times and that had to be cleansed because I was carrying that. It was stored in my body. It was stored in my soul. So my life then became a process of writing and teaching and talking and um, atoning, cleaning myself out. So that is, that is the inner game. Part yeah. of what we do now, this is, and someone asked me the other day, what does your martial arts training look like now? I was in a podcast with a friend of mine. He said, what does your martial arts training look like now? I said, it looks like this. This is what it is. This is the greater jihad. This is the budo. This is what Funakoshi would have been doing. This is what Kano would have been doing. This is what Ushi would have, would have been doing. This is what, you know, all of the, you know, Kimura, all of them would have found this. Yeah. You know, so, it's, uh, so this is what the martial arts training looks like now. Even uh, Musashi, uh, later on in life, yeah. he, he talks a lot on, he gave the swimmer, uh, he gave the sword up as such, and, and, yeah. and, and, and stuff. Um, and I also get the feeling, also get um tatty from your own and then also from from your own experiences i think it's what what's ha what happens to people in their past um it, as we become adults we're, we're kind of projecting that as you say we're projecting it onto the world so yeah. people may be wrong to us or the people that were maybe abusers or whatever we then project see them everywhere and, and yeah. constantly fighting that that battle um and kind of what you're saying is kind of you need to go back in inwards to to yeah. resolve that otherwise yeah. that battle is going to keep keep raging until you come forgive there. everybody give everybody over to their karma because uh, we can we we need to be forgiven as well there's none of us that haven't done things wrong in our thinking in our saying in our doing um, and we can only be forgiven to the level we can forgive other people maimonides said uh maimonides wrote a book called the 13 attributes of mercy um Forgive preemptively. So forgive before offence has been taken. Forgive in the aftermath of abuse. We all need mercy. And he's saying if you really want to be back to the centre, you have to give over all of your resentments. Give them all over. What we do with our resentments is we hold on to them and cling to them as though we've got some power there, but we're holding on to the instrument of our own torture. And it's also stopping us from evolving. Because whilst I'm looking at what you've done to me, I'm not looking at what I've done to other people. I had some of my friends and students absolutely betrayed me. And when I sat and wrote about it, I thought, well, why could I expect any different? I betrayed my first wife, I betrayed my children by having affairs, by becoming violent, by you know, becoming a criminal. I was a criminal for a while. You know, I was a bully and a thief. I don't, I, you know, nobody wants to hear that about themselves, but if I'm going to clean it, I need to know what it is, don't I? No good me saying, oh, you know, everybody does that. That's what everybody does. Everybody has a bit of knocked off gear. Everybody's, you know, you know what I mean? Everybody gossips a little bit. Everyone flirts a little bit. But actually, I was betraying, I was betraying my best friend and my blood relatives. So why, why would I complain when my students are betraying me or when my friends are betraying me? It's my own karma. If it's at my door, then it's my, it's my issue. Yeah. So I, I, I learned a lot by writing about it. And sometimes my writing would start off, you know, it would have an accusatory feel. But as soon as I, as soon as I put it down, you know, like I wrote a play once, for instance, about my brother dying from alcohol. And I wrote in there about how angry I was at my mom and dad because they were ashamed of my brother. They loved his bones, but they were ashamed of him. And in the play, my character said to the mom, um, tired of your shame i've had it all my life and the mother character in the play and she'd never said this to me in my own life but the mother character said you're the one that's ashamed 
And I was shocked. I said, me, what am I ashamed of? She said, you're ashamed of us. And I was. I, when my dad turned up at the hospital drunk, when my brother was dying from alcohol, and I was, I said I was angry. I wasn't angry, I was ashamed. I was embarrassed. I was ashamed of my dad. My dad was a working class guy. He was a hard worker, a provider, as my dad says, as my mum says. Um, he would never have thought that turning up to the hospital with a drink was, he would, ne would never have entered his mind that that wasn't a good thing to do. He would never have entered his mind. He had no idea what I was talking about when I got angry with him. He was just a dad. That's the first thing he said to me. I said, you're pissed. And he goes, you get out of my way. I'm the dad here. I'm the, he was trying to enforce his, he was the dad. He was trying to protect his son from something that was too late to protect it against. And I wasn't angry, Jonathan. I was ashamed. And I, I only found that by writing about it. I recognized that I was the one that was ashamed. Once I saw that I was ashamed, I was able to go into the exegesis, the explanation of that, the detail of that, and let it go. I don't feel ashamed of my dad now. I just couldn't love him more. I just see my dad as a product of his, um, you know, a product of his environment. You know, we were weaned on working men's clubs. You know, we were weaned on, you know, the big thing for us when we were kids was getting your club card to the working men's club. You know, we all, we all, all of us were drinkers. All of us, the whole, our whole culture. We were so conditioned that the whole of Coventry would, would have two weeks, they called it the Coventry holiday fortnight, two weeks every year at the same time when all of the factories went off to Skegness and Clacton. The Coventry holiday fortnight, we all went off at the same time and did the same things, got pissed. And, you know, obviously when you start to understand conditioning, you break that, you change that. You, you, get, out, you get out of the working classes. And you don't go into another class, you just recognise how silly class is altogether. Working class, middle class, upper class, it's all nonsense. It's just another conceptualization. I don't belong to any class. So it's um, the good thing about telling the truth is that you hear the truth. Yeah. If the, I can tell the truth about you, I'll hear the truth about me. The, going into to your, your, your recent book, The Divine CEO, um, how, how did that come about? Um, obviously, you've been on this journey. How, how did that, that book start? And um, what, how did you come up with the title as well? I'd wanted to write it for a long time and I kept trying to write it. I had three attempts at it and one of them I got 35, 40,000 words in, but I just realized I just, I couldn't find it. it. Just wasn't there. What I was writing was rubbish, but I knew that I wanted to do something called um, the divine economy. And that's one of the chapters in the book, but I wanted to call it the divine economy. And I was talking with an agent who was trying to get me a publishing deal. And he said, you should call it the uh, divine CEO. And I was oh, yeah, yeah. It was just the name stuck with me. And I never stayed with this agent. Um, he was a really lovely guy. It just didn't work out for us. Um, but I, let, I, kept, I stayed with the title. But I realized I couldn't find it. It wasn't coming out. And then I had a massive inspiration. Um, I read... Um, I read a couple of books by Shirley MacLaine about her, her experiences in the metaphysical. Have you had a chance to look at any of Shirley MacLaine's biographies? They're fascinating. I've been doing films and theatre and that for so long and, and non-fiction books, you know, like, um, uh, like didactic books, you know, books of teaching. I'd forgotten what, how, how nice it was to write um, like memoir in a memoir style, like by, in autobiographically. And reading her book really reminded me of how much I loved and missed that. So I read that one book and it inspired me to sit down and wrote, write a book that I'd been putting off for a long time called Notes from a Factory Floor. And I thought I was putting the book off because I just kept thinking, I'm never going to remember all this stuff. So much happened. But actually, I was afraid to sit down and write it because I knew that I'd have to dig up some dead bodies. I knew that the remnants of my karma that I hadn't looked at were in there. And that they would come out through the writing because I can't write, I can't not write honestly. That's what I do. I'm a confessionary writer. And I know it won't serve people if I don't write with honesty. And I know I'd made a vow to God early on that if I find the truth, I'll tell people. So I knew I had to do that. And even my kids said to me, Don't forget to write about what happened with mum. Don't forget to write, you know, 
what actually happened and the detail of that. And that filled me with terror because there was things there I wasn't proud of that I knew Sharon was going to read because she, there was stuff that Sharon didn't know because uh, she, she was going to type it all out. But it was confessionary to everybody. Um, so I wrote this book. Um, I mean, I literally, off the inspiration of Shirley MacLaine, I wrote 150,000 words in the next eight weeks. On the Friday that I finished notes, this was handwritten, Divine CO clicked in the head. I said to Sharon, I'm going to start writing this on Monday. I can feel it. It's there. I went up to walk up Coombe Abbey, which is a local park to me, and 20 chapter headings downloaded in my head. And I wrote them on emails and sent them to myself. On Monday, I started another eight weeks, another 150,000 words, and the Divine CO just poured through me. It's a great book. I'd like to take credit for it, but I can't because it just came through me. It picked up all my stories. It picked up all my flavors, but I don't own it. It just came through me. And I think that was because I'd removed all of the detritus. I'd removed all of the, um, all of the shizzle, you know, all of the old karma in notes. Um, and I, I made room for consciousness. I'd made room for God. So this came in as a result of writing notes. So they're kind of companion books in a way. Um, so each chapter I wrote was as much a surprise to me as it was to anybody else. Yeah. Um, and I really love it. I love, I love notes. It's, uh, even, you know, I mean, I'm making this book sound really serious, but the notes is really funny in places as well. Because uh, as you know, Jonathan, I am funny. I'm quite funny. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> the Irish didn't know I was from Belfast, did you? No. My family's from Belfast. Well, okay. Yeah, I'm from uh, my mum. My mum was born in uh, Carrick Fergus. Well, the Irish in me. That's I. I I live in Newton Abbey, which is basically beside Carrick Fergus. But I actually work in Carrick Fergus. Um, oh, yeah, I, well, we were from White Abbey. But, but okay. <laughs> yeah, small world. That's... Go to Carrick Fergus Castle, and you know when we were kids, and I I love the Irish. I mean, it's you know I I feel the lyric. I think that's why I'm a writer. I think my theatre and, and everything comes from that Irish heritage because there's some great Irish writers. Yeah. And there's, um, uh, there's a poetry to the, the, my best stuff. There's a real poetry to it. And I think that comes from the Irish. And my bluntness, come, my bluntness and my honesty comes from the Irish as well. My mum has got no edit at all. She's so, she is so Belfast, you know. She's more Belfast than a Belfast sink. She really is. She's so Irish, she's, and she's so uh, she's so lovely, she's so funny. Yeah. My oldest daughter, my oldest daughter Kerry, has got a great relationship with my mum. They're very close, but she just my mum doesn't even know she's being blunt. She's like, I don't know what I'm saying. People keep getting upset. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> she's very, you know, she feeds you and she tells you the truth. That's yeah. that's that's what you get from being brought up in the north of Ireland. No, I, 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 that's I never knew that. That's small world, like yeah. that's amazing. Um, with uh, I, I know we're 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 close for time. Um, and, and what, what I was going to ask was, um, with, with with everything today, obviously we live in a world um that like constant distractions. Um, especially from like even if you look back even ten years ago to, to now, um, there's more distractions than ever. Um. Everything's dying for your for your attention. Yeah. How how, how, how does somebody maybe the rock bottom or whatever? How does someone start the path of someone wants to kind of change their life in a way in, in a more positive action? What what's the best place to start if if, if, if there is? You got to, people have got to find out who they are. <clears throat> the geometric point, the singularity in us, is who we are. And who we are is the observer, not the voice at the front, you know, not the, uh, you know, not the bluster of the workplace or our occupation, but who we are in the very centre. And it's about it's about revealing who we are. Often we don't reveal who we are until we our life hits a crisis. We have an epiphany. They're both kind of the same thing. So it's locating who we are. If we don't know exactly who we are, then it's having enough courage and enough honesty to locate who we're not. They call this apophatic theology. It's the, th the theology of negation. So we don't know what God is, but we know what he isn't. So we can locate God by locating, by, 
by getting rid of everything he isn't, or we can locate our self, which at that at that um, at that geometric point, the self and God are not different. So the Atman and the Brahman are the same. The the, the soul and God are the same. So we can locate who we are by um, by actually looking at our life and going and, and recognizing who we're not. So I'm not a gossip. I'm not violent. I'm not angry. I'm not jealous. I'm not. I'm not judgmental. No, I'm not any of the the, the vices. Once we recognise that they're not godlike, they're not the things we'd like to see written in an epitaph about us. We wouldn't like to see those things written about us in the newspaper. We wouldn't even like our friends to know that we sat down yesterday over a coffee with somebody else and tore them a new arse on. That we, you know, we we assassinated their character. We wouldn't like them to know that. So when we start to go, yeah, that's a trait I don't not proud of that's where we start we start by uh, no longer engaging the parts of us that don't come from love or don't come from kindness but that's the deep the deepest esoteric training is really simple don't gossip today don't have a negative opinion about somebody you don't know nothing about them anyway nobody does unless you're omniscient you haven't really got much right to have an opinion about somebody else because you don't know the before the after and all the present, all we can, all we can really identify with is who we are. And it's no point in me having an opinion, a negative opinion about somebody, if I still, you know, if I still can't wipe my own nose, if I still can't even control my own waistline. So I'd love to look at myself. Am I eating too much? Am I carrying too much weight? Am I drinking too much? Am I destroying this vessel with cigarettes or drugs? Are the things in my life that are detrimental to this kingdom? This kingdom has trillions and trillions of cells, something like 50 billion cells just in the brain with something like 5 trillion synapse, firing synapses. You know, we're connected to everything. This is a divine vessel, be in no doubt. Do we have control of it? You know, we want to, people want to change the world, but they, but they can't even change their socks once a day. So let's come back to the very beginning, like, like Gandhi said, or like, I um, uh, can't remember the Russian guy, who was the Russian? Dostoevsky, you know, everybody wants to change the world, nobody wants to change himself. Um, so, you know, or, or Gandhi, be the change you want to be in the world. That, that is deeply esoteric. Even just to stop yourself from overeating today, from having too many drinks or having too much sugar, even just to stop yourself from being unkind about somebody else. Do a little exercise. When you go and have a coffee with your family, your friends, put a tape recorder down. Um, and just say, oh, I'm going to tape everything and anybody's name that comes up, if anybody's mentioned, I'm going to take the tape with them tomorrow and let them listen to it. See how this conversation changes, how quickly it changes. I remember talking to an agent once and she said something about my agent, who, who I'm very loyal to. And she said, oh, she's, oh, she's, not, I don't like the way, she's not very good with her child. And I said, oh, she... She speaks very, very highly of you. She only says, has good things to say about you. She said, oh, 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 she's, she's, look, she's great at her job. She's lovely. Gone. I killed it straight away by just saying, don't tell me that because I'm not going to accept it. I'm not going to go into a character assassination about somebody I like or about somebody I don't like. Unless I'm omniscient, unless I know everything that's ever happened to them and everything that will happen to them, I haven't got an opinion on it got too many things in my own life to fix if i feel as though i'm completely fixed then maybe i can have an opinion about something but if i've got everything if i've got everything completely fixed you can guarantee i won't be here anymore because i'll have done what i need to do on the great earth and i'll have moved on so start with get your palate right what you eat what you drink uh, what you inject you know what you take in through the senses what you're taking through the eyes, through the ears, um, you know, your environment, it's all food. Everything is food. If you're consuming lots of violent fear, then you're consuming fear. If you're violent films, if you're consuming sexual pornography, you're taking lots and lots of division into your body. You're letting it set up up in you, and then eventually you've got no control of it. You have to run to the fridge. You have to run to the, the computer to look at the sexual pornography. You know, you can't even sit with your with your with your friend and his wife without imagining sexual things um, or you get a negative email or a negative phone call and your endocrine system is 
commandeered, it's taken over. You know, other people have more control of our endocrine system than we do. So we, we, we don't really need to, it's not like I'm being a great bloke. I just understand law. I understand Dharma. I understand causation. I understand that if I have something, if I think something, say something, do something negative about somebody else, that is going to return to me. Even if I just carry it around as conscience and I'm, I am, you know, I am actively hurting somebody and there's no reason for it. And if I'm going to, if I'm going to process that through this body, then if I'm unkind to you, every one of my trillions of cells is going to process negative caustic chemicals in the process of being unkind about you. So start the, but it's what Sharon always says, my wife, the small things are the big things. You know, I used to say, well, it's just palate. Thanks. You know, you've got to get, you've got to get your, that's the foundation. You've got to get your palate right. And she said, yeah, but palate, you know, is massive. I can count on one hand the amount of people I know that can control their palate. And palate, like I said, isn't just you eat and drink. It's everything you ingest because everything is food. This is food now. This yeah. is good food because it's coming from an aligned place. It's coming from a place of kindness. My reason for being here is twofold. One, I want to serve you, whoever's viewing, and two, I want to serve me. I recognize that when I sit and, and share my story, both of us are fed. Yeah. God will give me something as well as you something. So I, some of the stuff I know, I don't know until I share it with other people. That's how the universe, that part of the Dharma is that we, we get the final portion of the knowledge when we share what we know with other people will be given something else. For instance, I went and taught a bloke and I was, um, he was a very esteemed guy, very uh, successful businessman, you know, very high up in, in the church, you know, in, in his dealings with the church, very high up in government. This is, um, it doesn't matter who he is. It's a guy I was doing some mentoring for. Um, and within two minutes of walking with him, uh, we started talking about Rumi, the poet Rumi, who was a Sufi poet. And, uh, and I said, I quoted one of his poems, love is not a subtle argument, the door there is devastation. And I said to him, do you know what that means? And he said, no. And I told him what it meant. And that was the first time I understood what it meant when I told him. So I, was, I, was give, I wanted to share it with him. So I, I was given the truth in order to share it to him. But I didn't know the truth until I shared it with him. So love is not a subtle argument, the door there is devastation. So our, our geometric point, our center, love, you know, the, the quantum vacuum, the singularity that is in every one of us is not a subtle argument. The door there is devastation. We have to get rid of all of these perceptions, conceptions, precepts, you know, the, the, the uh, cognitions, the, the false beliefs, you know, the million different opinions, the unkindnesses, we have to remove them in order to access singularity. So love is not a subtle argument. The door there is devastation. But I didn't know that until I spoke to this guy. And in telling him, I knew it. it you, do you, suppose in, if, if you look at your, uh, when, you, when you start working on the door and you start working in, in, in that environment and you've seen the reality of uh, conflict, and you went back and changed your martial arts, um, and and you start teaching people the, the kind of the who's the harsh truth of things. Um, yeah. This kind of, I suppose this is, this is a continuation. Um, yeah. Of what you're That's teaching now, this is just the next next level up. You're 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 kind of uh, telling people like an uncomfortable truth because we all kind of. If, if everyone was honest, we all do things that we're really not proud of. And yeah. um, sometimes we maybe get drawn into a conversation and it's about somebody and you walk away going, I, yeah. I wasn't I happy. I really before. like him, but no, yeah. he's been good. He's been very good to me, but no, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I know, you know, this, this is how it always starts. I, I, I like him, but we, 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 we think that by, by precursing it with, I like him. I know he's a decent guy, and then and we think that's gonna, you know, we think that's gonna negate everything we do. But if you put a tape recorder by somebody and just say, "I'm gonna tape everything, film everything," and then give it to the person and see how they feel, they'd be 
thinking very differently. But the process of it is that is that in order to do in order to be unkind, we have to access unkindness and we have to process it through ourselves. It's a deeply unhealthy thing. It's like drinking poison. But there's something in us, a parasite in us, that enjoys that. Uh, what Eckhart Tolle calls a pain body. Pain bodies feed off pain bodies. They feed off pain. They feed off drama. It's like an energy form that works through human beings and feeds off drama. It feeds off hate. It feeds off violence. And every time we engage it, even in gossip, even in negative thinking, we are feeding it. We're making it strong. The thing we want to get rid of, we're fattening up. So when we stop feeding it, when we make our body clean, make this body, this vessel clean, when we, when we cleanse the, the animal soul, the lower soul or the ego, we automatically connect to the higher soul. And this is the divine covenant. We create a divine covenant with the CEO. The CEO is like our own internal Moses, you know, it's like, or our own internal Muhammad or our own internal Krishna or our own internal Christ, it's within us. It's, they call it the Christ consciousness. So we connect to our higher soul and we create a covenant between the lower and the higher. And then we become a vessel for goodness. We become a vessel for love. We become a servant to our highest aspirations. What, what, would, what, would, want to be, what would be one of the biggest lessons you've learned on, on, your, on your journey to today? One of the biggest lessons? Um, is that is that uh, we are most people are living in the world and they don't understand the rules of the world they don't understand basic causation this isn't I'm not trying to sound smog because I didn't for a long long time um, uh, and if we don't understand causation we can't really do anything if we don't understand basic cause and effect or karma or reciprocity we are going to continue to do things uh, that are going to create negative waves in the world. And we don't think they affect anybody, but they affect everybody. If I drop a pebble in the water, the ripples will be met by the whole pool. So I, what I do in, in my little Coventry home can have an effect on some stranger, you know, at, in the furthest side of the earth, in Australia somewhere, or in India. We have an effect for the good or for the bad on every, everybody. Everything affects everything. If causation is real, which it is, it's a scientific precedent, then everything affects everything. So there's no, you know, we, we'll never even be able to find out the root cause of anything because unless you, uh, have a, unless you are uh, omniscient and you know um, every action of every person throughout his, the his, history of time, you can never find the original cause of anything. All you can know is that if you put negativity into the world, it will create negative, negativity in the world. And if you put positivity in, into the world, good intention, it will have a good effect. So there are two forces fighting each other. And our job is to go out into the battlefield and not to battle against the negativity, but to create more goodness, co continue to create goodness. So as we lift our level of consciousness, the level of consciousness of everybody is lifted with it. So everything we do affects everybody else. So we don't, we think we're sitting watching sexual pornography. It's not going to affect anybody but me. But, you know, we are taking part in, in, a, in a depravity, in a divide that is going to eventually affect everything in the world because everything affects everything. Do you know what I mean? You might, have, you might just create a small ripple, but as soon as that hits another small ripple and then another small ripple, it's not far before, long before you've hit a riptide, you've created a riptide that might break on the shore of some distant place and you'll go, nothing to do with me, nothing to do with me, I have nothing to do with, I don't even know these people. How could it be anything to do with me? But what we do in our, in our Belfast home, in our Coventry home, has an effect on everything. This is what, uh, when Julian of Norwich had a vision of God, he said to her, the world is a mess and it's your fault. Yeah. And what he was saying was that everything you do affects everything out there. So, it's simple. Start working from kindness. I know this firsthand. I'm certain of it because I created, I created lots of violence in my life from a displaced situation. Um, and once I realized, consciously realized it and saw it, I stopped doing it. And it took me some time. And I'm still making mistakes every day, the same as everybody else. I'm still a hypocrite. 
you know, I'm still tripping up, but I see it quicker. I redress quicker. I repent quicker. I come back to the center quicker. So I don't expect anybody to take my word for any of this, but I would, I would say if, if it triggers the spark of light, go out and develop it, do the rigor, you know, make it a, make it a, a line of inquiry and see for yourself. Once you understand causation, you start having, you start to understand your own body um, and you'll start to understand the world and you'll start to act in a way you'll, you'll be filled with awe and fear because you'll think, God, everything I'm doing is going to, at some point I'm going to see it again. So you start to do good things and you stop doing the bad things. So repentance means to return to the center means that we stop doing the things that keep us out of center and we start doing the things that attract center. Um, and that's what repentance is. That's what repair is. It takes time. But anybody out there who's watching this, even, if, even those that have done the most heinous things, the kids that are in prison or the kids that are, you know, people that are doing very negative things, everybody can repent. Everybody can return to the center. That's one of the 99 names of Allah. One of the, one of the attributes of God is, is um, repentance. We, we, we can all return to the center. All of us can, re, can return to the center. So we can work on that from now, from this minute. Yeah. Um, I know, obviously, I know uh, we're pushing push time for today. Um, even just quickly, just last two questions. Uh, if someone was watching this, and I know, obviously, uh, you're, you're being a very successful writer, what, what, what tips would you give to anyone who's going to be sitting going, I would love to be able to write or write about new experiences. How, where, where should they begin or how did they get started? Uh, what, what Sharon always says to me is, uh, we were talking to a director once. He just, all he did was talk about directing. He sat in cafe talking about directing. She said to me, he's not a director. I said, how do you know? She said, directors direct. And, and uh, another guy asked us about writing. She just said to him, writers write. Sit down and write. My first book, um, you know, I've got 50 books now in 21 languages, you know, um, and they're all over the world. Started with a notepad and a, and a biro, um, and, it, and I wrote it in the factory toilet. You don't, need, you don't need many materials to write. If you want to write, you'll write. When, when Frankel was in Auschwitz, he wrote on scraps of paper that he could find anywhere on anything. So writers write, sit down and write. When, when the opposition rises up, remember that's, that opposition will be consumed in the act of writing. You need the opposition. If there's no opposition, you're probably in the wrong place. So just sit and write. Sit down and write. Excellent. And what's, what's next for yourself? Um, are you working on other plays or books? I've just finished a book called 99 Reasons to Forgive. Okay. All about the stuff we're talking about. A fact, the fact that we can't really forgive, but we can give it over. We can't forgive ourselves, but we can repent. And it's showing us where our power is, where our power isn't. There's lots of debate about forgiveness and lots of confusion about forgiveness. And I really wanted to write something to try and... Uh, there's lots of good stuff out there about forgiveness. The Forgiveness Project is amazing. I just wanted to write what I'd learned from my experiences. So it's another piece of the jigsaw that hopefully will help people. So, excuse me, I'm talking to publishers about that at the moment, about... Uh, 99 reasons to forgive um, and other than that there's some film projects um, I'm studying a lot at the moment I'm deep, deeply studying every single day uh, and I consider this interview now as a part of my study uh, you know your, yours is quite a new podcast isn't it it is yes um, but I would say that I've, lo I've learned more from talking to you today than I have in, in most of the podcasts I've done recently Okay, thank there's you. something to, I don't know what it is. There's something about there's just a rawness to what we're doing. It's just me and you, and yeah. it's, you know, there's a modesty and a quietness to you. There's just something I felt things come out today that have really surprised me. So thank I you. Feel as well, I've got a lot from it. Well, uh, I appreciate that. Thanks very much, um, Jeff. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, again, your 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 books are all available on Amazon. And uh, Waterstones as well, and the Divine CEO is now available to, to purchase uh, on, on Amazon. I'll include a link uh, to, to your books um, on this. If, if anyone wants to, is, is, anyone, is there anyone able to contact you or, or reach out if, if they wanted to? 
they don't need to contact me. The whole idea of my books is to say, you don't need me. The problem with this, the, the, in Judaism, they talk about uh, a long, short way to enlightenment and a short, long way. The short, long way is to sit and listen to podcasts like this all the time, but not do anything. So you'll get a little hit, you'll feel good, you'll be inspired, but it won't get you there. The long, short way is when you take any information you get and turn inwards and connect to it in a guru. If you make me your guru, you've made a mistake. If you make anybody your guru, you've made a mistake. A good guru will lead you to your inner guide, your inner tutor. So they don't need to contact me. They don't need, they don't, you know, if, if I need to be in front of somebody or around somebody, that will happen. It will happen by serendipity. It will happen by, um, you know, like we've met through somebody else. Um, and I've, I just felt um, when Tony contacted me, I felt uh, an intuitive guide towards doing this. Um, but if they want to keep on up with the current work, they just need to go to my, the only presence I have on the internet is an Instagram page that's ran by uh, my friend Gabriella. She runs it for me. She puts all my, um, all my work on there. And that enables me to, you know, as you probably know, for the last 30 years, I've been an open door. I've, I've, my, my public, my email and my phone has always been public. And I've always, 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 just received calls and, and, and stuff like that. And now, now I'm being um, instructed in a different path. My, my guidance is telling me to concentrate, get the work down, get as much work as I can, and the work is very specific, and put it out into the world. And if there's anybody I'm meant to meet, I'll end up meeting them one way or another anyway. But there's no, there's no direct contact, but they don't need a direct contact. They need to, they need to pick up the books, um, mine and other people's box and find a link directly to their own guru. It's inside your own singularity. The problem with going outside too often, if we go outside too often, you know, we never go inside. Yeah. So it's, uh, so it's really just about saying um, the divine CEO particularly is a book that's saying, this is what you need to do. You don't need to be in front of me to hear me say it again. Because otherwise, it's just me. It's just me feeding you fish every day and never really teaching you to fish. So hopefully, this new book will say to people, show people how they can learn to fish for themselves. Once you've connected to your own inner guru, um, you know every answer you want. You know the the matrix, the the al the uh, the almanac, the Akashic library. You access through yourself. If you're going to access it through me or somebody else, it's always going to be second or third hand. It will be nice, you'll enjoy hearing it, but it won't have your signature on it. The only way to get the information with your signature on it is to go directly in to your own inner guru, and he will have your matrix there for you. Okay, that's good. Jeff, um, thank you again very much. Uh, and again, thank you very much for the, for the book. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm gonna, I said, I just started reading it. I'm looking forward to, to working my way through it. And uh, best wishes and, and, and continued success with your, with your upcoming books as well. Thanks, Ivan. Uh,